Hello everyone and welcome back to Always Watching. Today we're discussing the greatest show you probably have never seen before, Pashinko on Apple TV+. Plus. Season, season 2 is premiering, but if you have not seen Season 1, I highly recommend it. Although I don't recommend you binge watch it, it's definitely a slow burn that lays the foundation for what will be a fantastic Season 2. The adaptation of Min Jin Lee's novel picks up where both halves of the story left off. The first in 1945 with Sun Jia and her family, and the second in 1989 with Sun Jia's grandson Solomon, reeling from the devastating loss last season. The episode opens up with this beautiful shot of Osaka in 1945. We are greeted by Ko San managing a new arms shipment, and with World War II looming in the background, Ko San is at a crossroads. Every decision he makes is literally a matter of life or death. We are also reintroduced to Sun Jia. And she is barely getting by. Her kimchi business is suffering because cabbages as well as other resources are readily available. And on top of that, she has to take care of her two sons, Noah, who is much older now, and the newest addition to her family, Mozazu. We also learned that her husband is still incarcerated. It's been about seven years now. And despite all these hardships and despite this time period, it seems like the connection between Kosan and Sinja has not died. In fact, it's still just as strong as when we last, when we left them in season one. And these two characters have so much in common, namely that they are fighters and they always find a way out. One thing I loved about season one is that it takes its time to immerse you into this world. And this episode did a great job of reintroducing us to all the characters, particularly her two sons, Noah and Mozazu. And the contrast between them is night and day. I'll start with Mozazu. He wasn't in this episode very long, but he is a little firecracker. And I, I love the use of subtitles in this film, particularly the way certain characters use both Japanese and Korean. There's a lot of pressure for these characters to assimilate and discard of their culture, but they don't. And Muzazu is a very interesting little boy because he's very young, but he seems to have more pride and more confidence than everybody in his family. And I think it's a wonderful little detail to add to the show because ideally you want generations after you to be stronger than the ones before you. And so the fact that he has so much audacity is a good sign. Noah, on the other hand, is really struggling. He's a young man in extreme turmoil and extreme distress. He's also suffering from bullying, but he's not really handling it in the same way that his little brother is. He's not able to laugh it off as easily. He is really just trying to maintain, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that his father is in jail and he wants to make him proud. He doesn't really want to do anything that would shame him. After all, he is a priest. And I think the attention to detail with his character was wonderful because throughout the episode, we find out that he's reading a copy of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, which is a banned book, as if to say, I will always be who I am. Like it's, it's kind of like F you to everybody around him. And despite this pressure to assimilate and you know blend in and bow down, they resist. And this resistance is maintained in generations after them. And I think Solomon's character is such a great example of that. And I absolutely love Solomon's storyline. I think it's just so dramatic. I think he's a wonderful character. And I think he, he's a really great example of how your family history does shape who you are, how you perceive the world. Thanks to Solomon's grandmother, Sanja, he's very aware of his family's history. He's very aware of everything they had to do for him to live comfortably, for him to go to Yale, to live the life that he's living. And he feels that this knowledge sometimes is, is a setback. Is, is a hindrance. It's holding him back. We are reintroduced to Solomon and he is in shambles. His reputation has followed him after that deal gone wrong in season one. Basically, he's become a pariah. Everyone just like, no one wants to be around him. No one wants to do business with him. And one of my favorite lines in this episode is when Solomon is describing Tokyo 
as this metropolis that feels like a village. I think sometimes just because a society has developed economically, that doesn't mean they've really developed socially. The appearance of progress can really mask or hide very draconian beliefs that are really embedded in a society. And the show does a great job of just showing you and not really telling you through these two parallel stories. I think two scenes that worked really well together this episode is that chaotic grocery store scene and the dinner with Kosan and his business associate. So starting with Kosan, Kosan is at a dinner and he's discussing arm shipments and he's basically letting these men know that he has provided all these weapons for them, he's provided all these resources for them and he hopes that his loyalty will be rewarded. And one of the gentlemen sitting at the table looks at him almost offended you know, looks at him as if he's nothing and, and totally dismisses him. And not only does he dismiss Kosan, he paints a picture of him as this irrationally violent man. Now, Kosan definitely has done a lot in his life and he has, he's had to do those things to survive. But the picture that this gentleman was painting is one of a is one of an animal. And it seems like Kosan is a very good businessman. He's very reliable. If he says that he will deliver something, he will any means necessary. And you can even see it from this dinner spread. Like he really took care of them. However, however, his loyalty and his hard work is not reciprocated. To make matters worse, he's not really able to speak for himself. His father-in-law does all the talking for him. And one scene that really, really struck me is when his father-in-law describes Kosan as a generous man. And I guess it triggers one of the men at the table who makes this horrific joke about strapping rice to Koreans and making them swim it over to Japan. And he did that as a way of putting Kosan in his place because this scene is so brilliantly shot because they're all sitting at the same level. They're all just, you know, at face value, they all seem equal. But he takes this opportunity to kind of cut him down a size. Kosan is in an interesting position because they need him more than he needs them. And something about that irks these men in all the wrong ways. I thought this scene was great because despite these formalities, despite the amount of money he brings in, Despite the amount of food that he provides for them, he will always be made to feel like an outsider. And this scene worked so well with Solomon at the grocery store, like Solomon went off. Essentially his grandmother had ordered a cake for 50 people and this cake was not big enough. Something that should not have been that big of a deal. The grocery store attendant could have easily sent the cake back or said, I'm sorry, we'll make you a new one. Instead, he takes this opportunity to humble Solomon and his grandmother basically blames their Japanese for why they misunderstood the order and even lectures them about properly learning the language if they want to settle here. Something that's so jarring to even watch. In Solomon's face, he's just speechless. He doesn't know what to say. He reads off a laundry list of all the reasons why he's better than this man. Solomon and his grandmother have done everything to assimilate, to blend in, but Solomon in particular has totally exceeded societal standards. He's gone to the best schools. Like he is incredibly well-rounded. Like this is a son that any mother would be proud of. And yet here's this attendant talking down to them as if they're nothing, as if to say, I don't care what you've achieved we will never be equal. Mind you, this is some raggedy attendant that has no business talking to anybody this way. I think these two scenes work very well together because it's not about assimilation or learning the culture. Like they could do everything under the sun, but it, it still won't be enough. And their presence in this country is a stain. And although you're not responsible for your past, you do have an obligation to learn about it. So you don't repeat the same mistakes. Like I wouldn't be surprised if this raggedy attendant and this like man at the dinner table with Kosan, like I wouldn't be surprised if they were from the same lineage, the same bloodline, because the more aware you are of this history, the less likely you are to repeat the mistakes of those before you. Now Solomon is at a breaking point. His friends have alienated him. He's just, he doesn't really know what to do with himself. The only one willing to give him money is his father, which I thought was so sweet. And this scene about money between his dad and himself, I thought was really brilliant because even though they, are, they have the same background, I mean, they are of two different minds. Solomon grew up in America, like he went to school in America for the most part. 
and he has this kind of American mentality when it comes to making it and this idea of taking on debt is really frowned upon like ideally if you have debt you don't really want other people to know about it and when he finds out that his father took out a loan in order to give him some money he's not ecstatic he's heartbroken and his poor dad is looking at him like we've already sacrificed everything for you to be who you are what difference does a bank loan make? And I think the generational differences between them is so interesting because for someone like his father and his grandmother, taking out a loan is the only way to start their life. And it's not the end of the world because there's really no other way to build yourself up because you're starting from absolute zero. I think the difference between Solomon and his family is Solomon is a romantic. Like he, he really just wants to make it on his own through hard work, through perseverance. But sometimes you need a little bit of luck, right? Like sometimes you need that extra help. In the first storyline, Sanja is forced to sell wine because she has no other way to feed her two sons. And even though she knows the likelihood of her being caught is high, this is a risk that she has to take. Fast forward to her grandson, his version of that risk is going back to the same Japanese man that nearly incinerated him. And although we don't see the conversation in the first episode, I, you, it, it was really telling of like where his mind was. Like he's really at a place where he's feeling very bad about himself. He doesn't really know where else to go. And at this point, he wants to just regain what he lost, right? He's not thinking about building anymore. He's thinking about survival. He just wants to go back to the same job, the same position, a position and job that it didn't seem he liked very much and that he wanted to escape from. And Solomon is an interesting character because he has these ambitions and at the moment he's really wondering if this may have been his detriment, like his amb ambition might have been his detriment, like should I have just stayed at this job, should I, like why did I even come here in the first place? And he's so broken that he ends up giving the money back to his grandmother and he says something very interesting. He says, I can't, al I can't live always feeling sorry for you and he is just in turmoil because his grandmother and his father have instilled him with so much knowledge that he just he feels like it's a hindrance he doesn't know what to do with himself at this point and what he was essentially saying to his grandmother is like why should my history dictate my future like what does that have to do with me and he really desperately wants to follow this conventional path to success he knows on a deep level that's not really what would satisfy him. This is not really what would make him happy. What he really wants to do is build on his family's legacy, particularly to chip away at this perception that people have of individuals from his background that has haunted him through generations. Like what he really wants is for men like that shopkeeper to think twice before disrespecting him or anyone like him in public again. Like that's really what he wants, but he doesn't really know how to do it yet. And becoming CEO of a company that's not his isn't really going to break that glass ceiling. And I thought it was really telling that the last scene we see of Solomon and this businessman that he's about to meet up with in the next episode is during this speech where this businessman is basically saying how Japan has you know, risen from the ashes and has gone through so much, which it has. But you know who else has gone through so much? Solomon. And he, he is about to be a phoenix rising from the ashes. The episode ends with Kosan and Sanja. He basically informs her that the Americans are about to carpet bomb the entire country. And if they don't evacuate, they will all be eviscerated. Sanja says she can't really go anywhere without her husband. And the actor who plays Kosan is, is great because from his face, you, you can read a lot. On one hand, he's heartbroken. But on the other, he respects her loyalty. And one of my favorite lines in this whole episode is when he informs her that he didn't have to look for her because he never lost her in the first place and that he's been keeping tabs on her this entire time through this man, Mr. Kim, who Muzazu and pretty much everyone suspected that there was something off about this dude. Like he kind of comes on screen in the first few minutes and he did have spy energy. Like he was kind of, he was lingering for a bit too long. And he says, listen, I never lost you. I never will. And again, even though they haven't seen each other for, the, for a number of years, the, the intensity, the chemistry is still there. And that's how the episode ends. So you guys let me know what you think. Until next time.